Welcome back to AMB Garage. Today's video, I'll be doing an overview of a vertical 212 engine I'm building for a friend. Now, what do I mean when I say vertical 212 engine? Well, the 212 engine that you find in most mini bikes, go karts, they're mounted horizontally. This base is mounted horizontally to the ground. Now, if you want, I don't know your application, but if you're trying to put one of these on a bicycle frame, it doesn't fit very well. So the, the best way to get it to fit is to mount it vertically like this. So the base is mounted vertically to the ground. And this works really well because, I mean, it actually fits the frame. But a lot of people say, oh, if you do it like this, it'll blow up instantly. Now, there is some truth behind that, but I want to go over how you can mount your engine like this without it completely grenading. And after that, I'll go over these little goodies I'm adding to this engine that also apply to any other 212 engine. Now, the main reason why people think or say that a vertically mounted 212 engine would just blow up is a little thing called lubrication. Now, in a 212 engine or any other engine, lubrication is definitely the most important part of the motor because without it, it would just seize and all that fun stuff. But the, I think what people, the main reason why people think the vertical thing won't work is because the lubrication wouldn't get up in the piston because the oil has to travel against gravity. But that, I don't know. Um, but there's no oil pump. So the orientation of how you do that will not affect how well it pumps oil, if that makes sense. Now, yes, it does have to work against gravity, but that's not too big of an issue because I mean, sure, gravity is a lot stronger here, but it's also working against gravity working like this. Now, these engines are splash lubricated. So there's this little splasher, I don't know the technical term, on the connecting rod. And when it spins, it splashes oil onto the lobes of the camshaft. The camshaft sits right there, splashes those with oil, and then it makes their way up through these holes and lubricates the top of the head. Now, when the, when the uh, push rods move forward and back, it carries oil up like over the push rods and splashes it onto the rest of the valves. So sure it's working against gravity, but it doesn't make too much of a difference because it's already like doing it itself. Um, it's not merely just this splashing it up. It's actually the push rods doing a lot of the work to siphon the oil up to the valve. So that's pretty cool. Now, one thing when you, there is this oil cavity right here that fills up just a little bit past the end of this little splasher thing. And when you twist, when you rotate the engine vertically, you're actually expanding that oil capacity. So instead of 16 ounces or whatever the manufacturer recommends, you'll have to add right around a third, 30% more oil or something like that. So instead of 16 ounces, you'll need 24 ounces of oil. That basically just brings the oil lever level up enough to where the splasher does its thing. Now, um, yeah, and that's really the main reason why people want to critique uh, this whole setup, the reason why it won't work, but it does. Um, now, I do want to note that there are some other reasons, whatever, that I might not be aware of, but I do have experience with this uh, engine orientation. I mounted a 212 engine on my motorized bike and rode it for right around like 200 hours maybe. And while that's not super long amount of time, it's long enough to prove that your engine won't immediately just seize up. Um, now I did, through that time, I did rebuild the engine twice, not because major failure or anything, just because I didn't believe it myself that an engine could run healthy vertically. So like after I think 50 hours, right when you were supposed to do an oil change, I ripped the engine off, took the cover off, looked at the engine, all that stuff. And I was surprised there was no, no, uh, no signs of wear or anything like that. Like the cross hatching, it was lubricated so well, the cross hatching was still there and all that stuff. So then after I took the engine off the bike after 200 hours or so, 
I rebuilt it again, and the same exact thing. No signs of wear or anything like that. Now this is a different engine. Um, it's been sitting a really long time, so it has like that weird, I guess you could say rust spot to where the coating on the piston rings kind of made a mark. But I mean, you run your finger over it and you can't even tell a difference. So I do have experience and I know firsthand you can run an engine vertically, one of these engines vertically, without any issues at all. As long as you just put uh, 24 ounces of oil in instead of 16. Now, the power adders. Um, this is a non-Hemi 212 engine. If you have a Hemi, it's going to be completely different. Very different head, very different valve train, camshaft, crank, flywheel, very different. This is going to apply to just non-Hemi engines. Now, first off, the camshaft. The camshaft is pretty much the same as the Hemi engines. Um, there might be a little bit of difference, but these are not so much geared for high RPMs. They're geared for lower torque. So what that means, even if you take the, um, the governor off the motor, the governor is set at right around 3,600 RPM out of the box. If you go ahead and delete that, it might rev to, I don't know, five, 6,000 RPMs on this, uh, on this cam, but the dimensions the geometry of these lobes, they don't really give you so much power up in the higher RPMs. It kind of wean, it'll wean off right around 3,200 RPM or something like that. Now, um, and you can't really get any higher than that because one lift really suppresses how much air you can cram into this engine. And two, as I said before, the geometry isn't great for higher RPM. Now there's two ways to fix that. And that is, bigger cam, which means more lift and more aggressive geometry, or a cheaper alternative is to buy ratio rockers. Now what these do, basically the stock rockers on the right and the ratio rockers on the left. Basically what this does is it pulls the push rod hole towards the center more, if that makes sense. Now what that does, that decreases the leverage the push rod has on the lifter which means that the push rod is further towards the center than the actual, like, the, uh, darn, what pushes down the, what pushes down the valves. I forgot what that part of the rocker is called. But what that means is that if you push one millimeter, if the push rod pushes this part up one millimeter, it's going to push down on the valve 1.3 millimeters. So this is a 30% ratio rocker or a 1 to 1.3 ratio rocker, whereas this is a 1.1. So the distance between this uh, push rod hole in the center is equal to this side to the center. So what this does, this does not help the geometry of the crank of the camshaft at all. So you're still going to have the same like power band, but it's going to allow the the head, the valves to flow a lot more air because you're you have a lot more lift, which means it kind it doesn't move the power band RPMs up any, but it just allows you to cram more air, more fuel into the engine, giving you like a higher peak horsepower without giving you a ton more RPMs, if that makes sense. So uh, the, the guy, he's an older guy running this. He doesn't really want higher RPMs. He just wants that torque to cruise around. He's gonna have a CVT on this thing. Uh, so he doesn't really want to go any more than, you know, five, six thousand RPM. Uh, so that's great because it also doesn't wear your engine out as much. And these ratio rockers, I think were $15 or something. A new camshaft is like $120 or something like that. So these are a lot cheaper. Now, the a lot of people have gone over the valve springs. Um, the stock valve springs are good for right around 4,000 RPM but they start having float. They start having valve float basically means they're not stiff enough to sustain higher RPMs. So when they're compressed, they don't pop up fast enough and they kind of like jackhammer the rockers. And that can cause a lot of havoc to your entire valve train. How to fix that is stiffer valve springs. Basically it allows, it allows the valves to pop back up and make contact with the rockers at all time, uh, instead of, you know, having a lot of discrepancies. 
So those are good. Um, these are 26 pound valve springs. I'm pretty sure 26 or 28. These are good for, I don't know, 7,000 RPM, something like that. Now, one thing to keep in mind, don't go ham with the super heavy valve springs because if you're just running the stock valves, the stock seats, um, it, it can cause a lot of havoc on the push rods too, uh, just to compress these things. So you don't want to go overboard, but especially with this setup, we're not going to rev super high. So we don't need ridiculous, like 36 pound valve springs. Um, we're not going to do anything to the valves themselves. Of course, we're going to make sure to keep these little valve, uh, nub things that are on the top here. Um, we're probably going to replace the valve seats just so they don't leak, whatever. Uh, we're probably going to lap the valves. Um, they don't look horrible. Crap. I can't focus. They don't look horrible, but they might need a little lapping. Um, so that's pretty cool just on the head. Um, now one thing to note, now I do want to note this billet connecting rod. Crap. Let me hold on. The crankshaft kind of pushed out a little bit. So this billet connecting rod, a lot of people say, oh, you don't need that. Well, also a lot of people say you do need that because, uh, yeah, if you're spinning RPMs any higher than what these are governed for stock, uh, the stock connecting rod has some issues. Not so much that the connecting rod will break, but if you notice, the, the bearing is not a bearing. It's actually part of the really flimsy cast aluminum that the connecting rod is made of. So it's not spinning on a hardened bearing that the oil splashes in between. It's actually the connecting rod itself. That is not good at all. So if you're spinning higher RPMs, there's really not a great way to get oil in here and you'll just eventually shred this. Now the billet connecting rod is a ton stronger. How it clamps down just the thickness between these two walls here is so much thicker but it's billet so it's a lot stronger as well um the oiler splasher thingy is a lot better this is just a like long probe this actually has like a whole divot spoon in here and a hole that goes to that bearing so it, it lubricates it so much better um now one thing i also want to note if you look on amazon there's primarily four dimensions for the billet fly uh, the billet connecting rod. The main 212 connecting rod length um, and then there's the connecting rod length for the smaller 206 or 196 uh, cc engines. Those have slightly shorter stroke and a slightly shorter connecting rod. Now uh, then you'll notice uh, two more dimensions and basically those are a quarter inch I think longer connecting rod basically what that allows you to do is at top dead center the piston sits level with the head whereas if you just get the regular length connecting rod or the stock connecting rod that piston is going to sit quarter of an inch lower than the deck height of the cylinder and what that means with this you can run a lot higher compression uh, all of that stuff uh, so that's pretty cool. That's one thing to note. Um, you could also just deck the head, deck the cylinder, um, or you can run a really thin head gasket. Now you do want to be really careful if you're running a head with an, a really lift heavy can, or you're running ratio rockers, or you're running a flat top piston with uh, with a really long connecting rod and the short head gasket, that's going to mean that your valves will come really close to your piston, and that's typically not good at all. So it's always best when you're doing head stuff, when you're changing the head gasket to a thinner material, you're doing ratio rockers or a new camshaft, before you run the engine and put it together permanently, you really want to put the head on there semi-permanently, torque it down just enough and make sure that the valves don't come anywhere near the piston. Um, but yeah, now you may notice this is a dome top piston, not a flat top. Um, this helps with the valve clearance, but the, the owner of this 
didn't want to do a flat top piston for some reason. Uh, I'm not complaining much, but there will you can run even higher compression if you have a flat top piston. Now, for goodies, we have a TM24 Makuni carburetor, genuine. So that's pretty cool. We'll put that on when we get the engine fully built, all that fun stuff. And we do have one of these cheap, I think this was like $28, $25, a cast aluminum flywheel. These magnets don't look too great, but they should be better than the stock magnets. Now, basically the whole thing with this, it's lighter, so it'll spin faster. And the ignition timing, where's the magnets? The ignition timing is uh, advanced, I think, six degrees, which just makes everything run a little bit better, uh, makes, makes it a little more rev happy. Now, you can, you can set the ignition a little bit more advanced using offset keys or what have you, but I really like this flywheel, or at least I really like the design of this flywheel, because that 28 degrees of ignition timing that this supposedly has is right around the same that you get with all the other even billet flywheels. Now they do make really expensive billet flywheels that are adjustable, so you can adjust the timing however you want, but you can kind of do the same within reason with the offset with the offset uh, timing keys. So we'll give that a try, but this should lay out a really good groundwork for this whole setup. Now to boot, we also have Cremoli push rods, which should work really well versus oops, for not bending or uh, having play with these stiff valve springs and the higher lift that we'll have with the ratio rockers. So with that all being said, this was a pretty long-winded uh, video, but I'll give another shorter video when we have everything on the bike. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good one.